Hi and welcome. Thank you so much for clicking and watching. My name is Tanya Avrith. Um, I am an educational consultant with Amplified IT and today I'm going to be speaking to you about the importance of embracing your child's digital life and ways that you can do so. Um, if you're watching this, either you're a parent or a teacher or just someone who's interested in learning a little bit more about strategies for embracing your child's digital life. So I want to ask you a little question that, that, that you can think about. When's the last time that you went into a Blockbuster video store? Think about it. I know for me, I think it was probably about, what, three years ago? Maybe I stepped in when they were closing um, or when things were starting to go sour. So you have to think, when was the last time you went into a Blockbuster video? But think about that for a moment because the truth is Blockbuster really seems like something like an obsolete idea now. But it really wasn't that long ago that we were still going into the stores and renting videos. And the truth is, I don't think Blockbuster even realized how quickly that shift was going to happen. And I feel like when we think about Blockbuster and how quickly that transition happened, you have to think, well, that transition is happening rapidly everywhere and in all different types of industry. But if we think about our schools, they're still very much like the way they were, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And for our children, there's been a huge shift. Think about how our children go home at night and they live in a fast-paced digital world where they have access to technology and uh, information at their fingertips. They live in a Netflix world. They have access to things simultaneously whenever they need it. But when they go to school, they are still sitting very much in an analog blockbuster classroom. And it's a sad situation because the truth is all the technology that we ima we could ever imagine that that we you know had all different you know ways of, and and devices to use to do the very same thing that our children most of our children have access to just in the palm of their hands so things have definitely shifted and for our children the technology that we find so fascinating and so new really 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 if you think about it for them that technology will essentially be the equivalent of what I remember um, using as a child which was the Commodore 64 and now when I think back about the Commodore 64 it's almost archaic to think about you know how we used to use computers and what we did on them so when we think about our children it's pretty incredible because they're never going to know a world without technology or without FaceTime. Um, my, my son will never, ever, ever, ever know, you know what it is to not be able to talk with a video phone with his grandmother or his cousins that live um, across the country. So that shift has completely shattered, um, you know, for our kids what they understand because they live in a digital world and if you think about it if you look at this this you know this chart and you think well a child that was born in 1998 was literally born the year that Google came out I mean that's in amazing so our high school students are literally the Google generation or the Facebook generation for that matter because they were six years old when Facebook came out. So their lives are, are, are completely embedded with all the technology that is available um, to them today. And what I find very interesting is it's so intuitive for the most part for them, but not necessarily completely understood in terms of how to navigate it in the right way. So what I often say to parents and to teachers is, 
Yes, our children understand how to use technology. They understand how to function and, and how to play. And they're not afraid to tinker and touch and explore. But they don't necessarily have the ethical or um, the, the moral compass to make the right decisions. And so we still play a vital role for our children in terms of guiding them and teaching them about how to use it appropriately and how to use it and harness its power because it is an amazing tool that they need to learn how to harness and it does not come natural to them. And it's also very important that we understand that the shift in education is necessary and it's urgent and that as a parent we need to question the way that our children are being taught at school and as teachers we need to shift the way that we teach our students in our schools because if we are still just asking questions that our children can easily google if we are missing the opportunities to teach our students and our children the importance of asking questions and how to ask effective questions then we are we are they are at a disservice. We are we are not doing our jobs. So it is essential that we understand that shift and how important it is for our children to understand the importance of asking questions and not just regurgitating information because they live at a time where if they need information, all they need to do is Google it. So our children now, we're growing up in this, as Howard Gardner's speaks about the app generation we need to teach our children and they need to learn how to communicate using technology and the web and social media they need to also learn how to ident to identify themselves online a big part of what they do is function and socialize and and communicate online and they don't see a difference between their online lives and their digital lives for them it's just being. It's part of who they are. So we have to understand how that works for them. And we also have to teach them and help them identify themselves um, online and, and, and understand what that looks like uh, to themselves, but also to others. Um, they, we also need to help them learn how to build intimate relationships, both online and offline, because their online lives are they're growing up, you know, on on a stage essentially. And so they have to understand what that looks like and what that um and how to sort of navigate those relationships that they're building online as well. And we also have to have these conversations with them about how to express themselves and what's appropriate and you know how they're perceived with still being authentic to who they are, but understanding that who they are online is 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 definitely perceived or can be perceived in a different way than how perhaps they might be perceived um you know in a face to face conversation so i i i love to refer to you know some of the i'm i'm really you know speaking a lot of I, of the ideas that Howard Gardner speaks about in the app generation um, and it's important to understand that for our children, they're navigating through this world and they're sort of, they have this understanding that, you know, there's an app for that, but we need to teach them how to be critical thinkers so that they don't get stuck in those apps and that they understand that they don't have to just, you know, look at the app and think, well, oh, whatever I need to know is in here. We want them to be able to understand that they can search elsewhere. They can, they can combine apps and they can look up and ask questions and so it's important that we don't get caught up in this sort of uh, thinking that you know whatever it is that they need you know is available to them at their fingertips as well so it's really important when we think about our children that one day they're going to be googled not just like one day in the future like very soon if they if you have teenagers and they're applying for college if you have you know um you know children uh that are um you know applying for a job at McDonald's tomorrow they're going to be googled and so what are we going to find when we google them 
because you have to think that Google for them is their new resume. You know, their Google name is the resume. And I like to, to say the paper resume is dead because the truth is they are going to be Googled. And we want to make sure that they understand that A, that's going to be a ha happening and that's a reality. But B, we want to give them opportunities so that they have things that they are googled for and that they're positive so we teach them by doing by getting them online by showing them how to use social media because you know their their presence their their digital legacies genuinely will be their blogs their twitter accounts their youtube channels um you know their digital portfolios and essentially any anything anything that's going to come up that they're attached to that will be their digital resume, their digital legacy. But the thing is, we have to teach them about, you know, how to, to navigate this properly. So uh, very often when I go to speak to schools, I, I talk a lot about um, the adult mind versus teenage mind. And obviously, we, you know, we know that our students don't even have their... Um, the understanding or their their brain development is not, um, you know, is not fully developed until they're probably in their early to mid twenties. So the way that they interpret things is does not always the way that we would interpret. So, for example, when we talk to them about sexting, when I go into schools and I've you know gone in and spoken to thousands of students, it's very interesting to hear what they think about when we talk to them about sexting because I think that just in you know if they understand you know the importance of privacy online and the importance of those legal literacies of like what can happen if they actually do um, you know post something that is illegal or um, you know distribute meaning share something that is illegal like an you know a, a child pornography which is essentially any sort of image that if uh, of a child you know anyone under 18 then it's important that they understand that those legal literacies because they get this is when they get in trouble and so they don't have the the I think the you know the the understanding they're they're sort of this gray area that they see because um they think that if they delete the image then they're fine and i have to teach the kids that no even if you delete an image and it's past you and you didn't ask for it and you didn't pass it on you could still be legally or liable um and so it's really important that we have these discussions and 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 these are things that we speak about with them and the other thing that i speak about when i'm speaking to these children is that whatever you post online is never private. It's never private. But, you know, it's easy to say that, and, and, you know, it seems very obvious, but they don't really understand that. Our students have this false perception of privacy. They, they live in this, like, Facebook privacy world where they think that if they put their privacy settings on, if they actually, you know, we've been teaching them for so long the importance of having privacy settings. And so they live in this sort of world in this, you know, this in this app of privacy. And they think, well, if I have my privacy settings on, then, you know, I'm okay. I can post that picture of me getting drunk or me, you know, being completely inappropriate because my privacy settings on no one can see it and so I say to them that you know I know and I ask the students like well how many friends do you have 100 friends 200 friends you know and I've I've gone up to a thousand you know 1300 friends with kids that will you know keep their hands up when I ask them how many friends do you have and it blows my mind I say to them you know, and do you have your privacy settings on after they have 1,300 friends on? And they'll say, oh, yeah, I have my privacy settings on. And I'll say, why? What's the point? What's the point? If you have 1,300 friends, what difference does it make if you have a, if it's, if it's on private? You know, even if you have five friends, three, anyone, and I ask them, how many of you know how to take a screenshot? And they, you know, most of the time, 80% of the kids, they'll raise their hands. We know how to take a screenshot. And I say, so you mean to tell me if you posted something on your private social media presence, if I wanted to take a screenshot and share it, I couldn't do that? And they go, oh, 
you know, so they start, you know, they start realizing, well, hold on, this really isn't that private. And the same thing with Snapchat. There are third party applications that allow you to save, you know, images off Snapchat. Can I not take a picture of my Snapchat? Can I not take a screenshot? I mean, there is no such thing as privacy. And so when they start to understand that, we start to explain to them, well, you know what, if there's no such thing as privacy, if you can understand that, then you know what? Once you start understanding that, then you can start moving forward. You can start saying, okay, I understand there's no such thing as privacy. And because I understand that, then maybe the things that I'm going to post are going to be positive, positive contributions. So I teach the kids these three questions before posting. And those are, would your mother approve? Would it embarrass your grandmother? And could it hurt you from getting a job? And I call it the three question reflection and I get the kids to think about that. And, you know, it's amazing how quiet the room gets when we actually have these conversations with them, because the truth is nobody is having these conversations with these kids. Um, I mean, maybe they are, but maybe they're not speaking, you know, the way that they, in a way that they understand. So it's important that we understand social media and learn how to speak social media to explain it to them in a way that they buy in and, and know that, you know, we know what we're talking about and we understand what they're doing and we're here to help them. The other thing that we have to think about as parents, you know, very often I'll work with schools and parents will be upset if my the children are using devices. And I have to explain to them that there's a very big difference between students who are using technology in a very passive way versus our children who are using technology in a very creative way. And um, I'm going to have a, a shout out for Dr. Alyssa Sklar, who also uh, sort of opened my eyes to this. And so she spoke about, you know, that not all screen time is equal. There's a very big difference between using, um, you know, technology to passively consume, you know, a game or, uh, you know, a video versus having a child who actually is going on contributing, blogging, you know, um, going onto a, a website like DeviantArt and sharing, you know, beautiful pieces of uh, their art or discussing art with, you know, a community that, you know, shares an interest. So it's very different when you're passive versus being really creative online. Um, and, and when our children are using technology effectively, they are using it in a very creative way that helps make their thinking visible, that gives them a voice, and allows them to publish their work. So you have to think that if that's how you're using it with your children, perhaps you want to think about more creative ways of using it with them. So some ideas, some guidelines for parents. Um, how do we begin to embrace our children's digital life? What are some of the things that we should be thinking about? Or, you know, first of all, we have to think about, you know, the safety. You know, we have to teach our children about the importance of just, you know, not being so trustworthy, um, you know, and, and sharing things that could potentially be harmful, like their, you know, uh, you know, their address or, um, you know, their, where they live or where they go to school. We have to teach them about responsibility. You know, um, the idea is that if they're going to get this device, that they don't own this device. I make it very clear to my daughter, I own this device, I let you use it. It is your responsibility to charge it. It is your responsibility, you know, to keep it on um, or turned off when I say so. And if I had a teenager and I gave her a phone, I would say it is your responsibility to have this phone charged and ready to roll. And if I call you, you answer it. So, you know, it's really about setting those guidelines with your children. It's also important to teach our children about moderation. It always blows my mind when I hear um, about, you know, children sleeping with their devices, which I'll talk about a bit later, um, and, you know, you know and, and using them, you know, to the extent that they do without understanding that, like everything else, it's okay to turn it off. It's okay to read a book. It's okay to not have your technology on all the time. It's important that it's used in moderation. We really want our children to be creative and, and learn how to use technology to 
um, to get their message out and to be able to show um, their messages and communicate in many different ways. And it's really important that we're teaching them the important and how to connect and how to network themselves as they grow older in a positive way um, because that's how they will essentially make connections um, as they grow older because that's a big part of those digital literacy skills that they'll need to know. And so I think it's also important that we ex understand that there's a huge difference between skills and experience. As somebody... Um, who loves YouTube, I, I, you know, I can go in and I could, or, you know, anyone can go in and look up a video that would explain us how to read an MRI. But does that give me, but because I go on and I learn, you know, from this doctor on YouTube how to read an MRI, does that mean that I have the experience to perform one and understand how, you know, how that would be? Um, would I have that experience? Would I have the education? Would I under have that full understanding? Absolutely not. And it's the same thing with technology. Our children definitely know how to go in and, you know, go um, and, you know, use technology and, and function and touch things and they're not afraid. But do they necessarily have the, the, the experience and expertise that we have in terms of, uh, you know, as teachers, you know, how to teach and how to learn. And as parents, you know, the ethical direction of how to use things um, and what's right and wrong. Absolutely not. So it's really important that we understand that our role, you know, just because maybe we don't understand everything that they're doing, our role is still very, very important. And, 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 and our experience is still extremely important when navigating and helping our children. So when we ask, at what age do I start teaching my kids about digital technologies? As Dr. Alyssa Sklar says, from the moment they can swipe. And literally, if you think about it, we, um, you know, we are giving ch our children technology from the time that they're teeny tiny, that they're slurping all over their children's, you know, uh, there are, there are their parents, you know, five six hundred dollars you know smartphone and so we need from a very young age to begin to teach them how to use it and how to use it properly and so as again as Dr. Alyssa Sklar speaks about is you know well how will your kids learn to drive um, you know it's amazing to think that our children um, you know they're we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't give them um, the keys to our car. Um, I mean, we really wouldn't, but we have absolutely no issues, you know, allowing them to have a smartphone or a computer in their room um, that, you know, essentially could also get them in uh, a lot of trouble, you know. And so you have to think that we wouldn't allow our children to drive because, you know, a 12-year-old doesn't have the, uh, you know, the decision-making uh, capability, and uh, you know, her brain or his brain is not developed yet to make those decisions. And so why is it okay that we would allow our children to make these decisions online without our guidance and without um, uh, us teaching them how to do that? So I love this quote, um, as Dr. Alyssa Sklar um, says, freedom is a privilege to be earned through consistent, responsible behavior. And so we are not just going to hand off technology. They are going to show us with our guidance how they are using it properly. And the more we give them and teach them um, in the more freedom that they will have and that will be a trade-off with the, them showing us that they are ready to receive that responsibility. And it's really important that we teach our children that there is no such thing as privacy from parents online, like ever. There's absolutely no such thing as privacy from anyone online, period. Um, I mean, I think ever, but especially, you know, if we think about it, they have to, in terms of, you know, that, 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 I guess, you know, that perception of privacy, it's important that they understand that, you know, as children, 
until they, you know, those, they've earned that freedom, I'm going to hold their passwords. I'm going to go in and do checks in their YouTube channel or their Facebook or their, you know, whatever it is that they're using. I want to sit down with them from a young age because believe me, I recognize that once they hit high school, if you haven't been setting these boundaries, it's very difficult to say to a high schooler, I'd like your passwords and I want to look into your accounts. It's not going to happen. This is why it's teaching our children from such a young age is so crucial because if you build that relationship with them and they understand that it's not their world online versus, you know, the world that we live in um, with mommy and daddy, that if they understand that from a young age, then you'll have a lot easier buy-in when you're trying to teach them about that importance and that communication will be open and you'll have a better understanding of what they're doing online. Because I would say to parents, sit down with your children, open up the computer, go through things that they're looking at, Go through settings. Talk about them together. Even if you don't know it, learn together. Be vulnerable with them. Take the time to do this because this is a literacy skill. It's like reading and writing. We are all learning this together. We are all navigating this together. And so it's really important that we do that. Definitely set limits on screen time. I generally try to keep screen time if it's going to be creative that's a different situation but if it is a bit more passive I try not to have it that often it doesn't happen that often during the week I'll you know I'll have the kids passive usually on the weekend but that's just my you know I I, I, I don't set the rules for everyone but that's sort of um, my sort of take on that I think it's also important that we teach our children to respect others because odds are our child's not going to be the victim of bullying or cyberbullying. More, they're more like, or, or you know, um, sorry, I take that back. Our children are less likely to be victims of a child predator. Um, and not to say that that's not, uh, you know, something to think about. It definitely is. But they're more likely to be mean to each other than they are um, to actually, you know, encountering a child predator. So you have to think, well, if that's the case, we really need to concentrate on how important it is to respect others and respect yourself in general every day and online. So some ideas to think about. First of all, elementary school kids should always ask permission to open all accounts. Um, without question, get them in the habit of coming to you and, you know, seeking out um, your your word or your okay to do so. Elementary school children do not need to have private passwords. They should be sharing their usernames with their parents. If they are going to video chat, which is something that kids love to do, and I recommend that even as they grow older, video chat should be limited to places until, of course, that they're you know we feel at ease to trust them. You know, with that consistent behavior. But I prefer video chat to happen in common rooms. Um, there's no reason to have video chat at the young age behind a closed door. And understand that parents have access to all digital content. There is no privacy online. It does not exist. High school age teens really need to learn that, you know, they have to earn online freedoms and privacy in increments by showing good judgment. So the more we see good judgment happening, the more that is when you you, you know you provide them with those increments of freedom. You don't just hand off a child with a smartphone access to the internet without teaching them how to use the functions, going through the privacy settings, you know, setting things up and then as you see that they're learning, providing them with more and more freedom. Banning things is not going to work either. You know, telling them that they cannot do something will more likely lead them to doing what you've told them not to do. So I know a lot of parents that, you know, hold off from their children getting, you know, Facebook accounts or going on Twitter. Um, you know, and the child will go on behind your back and then you don't even know what's going on. Younger teens shouldn't video chat behind closed doors, as I said before. 
it's really a good idea to give your children high quality online resources for the information that they might want um, because more likely than not if you don't provide them with those high quality resources especially children who are curious about their sexuality then they're going to more likely go on to sites that we don't want them to be on so providing them with a site and I'll speak about some of them in a bit that would provide them with high quality content is a much better way of being proactive and also it's important that we should be reminded of the consequences of bad behaviors online um, I think it's important that they understand that that's something that just shouldn't be given to them and parents as parents we also have to think about the way that we model our behavior online we have to in reinforce the idea of privacy and teach them about sharing. We have to discuss the importance of protecting passwords. I talk about passwords the way that I talk about toothbrushes. I say to my kids, would you share your toothbrush? Well, your toothbrush is like your password. It is not something that you share with just everybody. Spend quality time with your children online. Do things with them that is worthwhile. I personally blog with my daughter and that's a way that I teach her about being positive and about being a positive citizen online. That she's contributing to the, to the world and asking questions and that she has an audience for her work. That's a positive way of spending time with your child online. Regular demonstrate the uses of the internet. Go through things with them. Learn together. Check those browser histories and believe me when I tell you if they're deleted, start questioning it because your kids will learn very quickly how to delete those browser histories. And again, you have to model the behavior. And I'm not, you know, believe me, I don't stand in a glass home throwing, you know, stones because I am constantly also putting myself in positions where I have to almost give myself a slap and, and close my device because our children one day will be teenagers and they will be sitting at the kitchen table and we will be asking them to turn off their 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 phone and they will look at us and say, but ma, you didn't do it either. And so what will we say when that happens? And this is probably the one of the best pieces of advice that I can give you. It's so important to set up a charging station in your room starting at a very young age our children need a disconnect from the technology and if they are sleeping with their digital devices and they are using them in the middle of the night that is when they are getting in trouble they do not have um, you know they are not making great decisions when they're tired at night that's when the you know the instances of bullying and chat roulette and things that you know I dealt with as a tech integrator in the high schools that I worked at those were the times that things were happening and I'd say to parents well why do they have their you know their laptop or their their phones or their mobile devices in their rooms in the middle of the night they should be in a docking station in the parents room and that is something that you have to start at a very very young age and it's really 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 good advice that you you should definitely pass along to your friends um, because I don't think people realize how important that is. I mean, think about it. Would you allow your child to sleep with the door open, um, you know, with strangers coming in? Of course not. So then why would you allow your child to sleep in a room where they have access to the world at their fingertips? So some things to think about. Um, I recommend for parents that they form a family um acceptable use guideline and so um, you know there's some really great ones with the family online safety contract common sense media also has phenomenal resources um, to um, to access uh, for family contracts and have your child come up with those guidelines have them empower them don't give it to them let them come up with what is appropriate and then go over it every so often with them to make sure that you're on the right track. Include them in those processes. They'll own that a lot more than if you just give them the rules. And some cool places to direct them 
Khan Academy has wonderful resources. Um, another one that I actually don't have here that I'll have to add is Learning Bird. Phenomenal place to, you know, direct your children. That one has a, a bit of a fee, but it's well worth it. Um, TED, um, TED Ed, one of my favorite places um, to, to look and share ideas and questions uh, that our children can watch. Um, Scarletine, that's one of the high quality resources I was referring to before, um, that, um, is sex ed for, um, our children to look at. Wattpad, I had, um, a student last year who was a published author, um, um, you know, and used that to do that. And some of my favorite recommended iPad apps, my absolute probably favorite would be this one on the right. It's called Book Creator. Um, why not create books with your children? I have books of my daughter since she's three. She's turning seven where she was talking through her work. Beautiful. So this is um, an example of a wonderful digital citizen. And um, this was my student Cheyenne last year. And, uh, you know, she was embracing technology in a way that we will, you know, we wish all of our kids would. Um, she understood that, you know, she wanted to have a voice with the technology and, uh, you know, she, you know, this is, this is what we need to be thinking about, um, teaching her, you know, as I was saying before, how to be a published author, harnessing the power of social media. Um, these were things that she was able to do, um, and she was really learning how to embrace that technology, embrace her digital life with an authentic audience. So our job is to prepare our children for tomorrow. And um, I hope that I've given you some ideas to get that going. Um, thank you so much. And I, I hope to see you soon.